Welcome to module one of digital signal processing. In this module, we are going to see what signals actually are. We're going to go through a history, see the earliest examples of discrete time signals. Actually, it goes back to Egyptian times. Then through this history, see how digital signals, for example, with the telegraph signals became important in communications. And today, how signals are pervasive in many applications in everyday life objects. For this, we're going to see what the signal is, what a continuous time analog signal is, what the discrete time continuous amplitude signal is, and how these signals relate to each other and are used in communication devices. We are not going to have any math in this first module. It's more illustrative and the mathematics will come later in the class. Hi, and welcome to our digital signal processing class. In this introduction, we would like to give you an overview of what digital signal processing is all about. And perhaps the best way to do that is to consider in turn what we mean when we use the word signal, when we use the word processing, or the word digital. And you will see that digital signal processing is really an intermediate point in a reflection about physics, about math, and about the reality around us that started a very long time ago and continues to this day. So let's consider the concept of signal to begin with. In general, a signal is a description of the evolution of a physical phenomenon. This is best understood by example. Take the weather, for instance. The weather is a physical phenomenon that we usually measure in terms of temperature. So temperature becomes a signal that evolves over time and that represents a measurement of the underlying physical phenomenon. We could have chosen another variable, for instance, we could have chosen rainfall, uh, that would constitute another signal related to the same underlying physical phenomenon. Another example, easy to understand, is sound. A sound can have very many origins, take for instance a musical instrument or a person singing. Now when you measure sound with a microphone, for instance, what you're measuring is the pressure, the air pressure, at the point of measurement. The microphone translates the air pressure into an electrical signal that represents the sound. Now, if you want to record the sound on a magnetic tape, for instance, you will have to convert this electrical signal to a magnetic deviation that can be impressed over the magnetic tape. And again, these are different representations of the same underlying physical phenomenon. Taking a photograph is a very similar operation. In this case, we're mapping the light intensity of a scene onto gray levels, in the case of a black and white photograph, that can be recorded by photographic paper. The only difference is that, in this case, we're mapping the signal over space rather than over time. To make things more tangible, let's go back to an experiment that most likely you carried out in elementary school when you first learned about experimental procedures and analysis of the world around you. You were probably asked to map the daily temperature for, say, a period of a month and to chart it over graph paper. And so you dutifully looked at the thermometer every morning and then at the end of the month you probably ended up with a graph like this. So here we have two concepts that are fundamental to digital signal processing. The first concept is that the temperature measurements are taken at discrete moments in time and they constitute a finite countable set. And the second similar observation is that the range of temperature is actually subdivided into a finite number of possible values which are determined by the resolution of the graduating scale on the thermometer. So we look at the height of the mercury column and we choose the tick that is closest to that level. But nonetheless the number of ticks that we can choose from is finite. So the two fundamental concepts here are the discretization of time due to the fact that we take observations regularly but not continuously and the discretization of amplitudes due to the fact that our measuring device has a finite resolution. Now the discretization of amplitude is usually treated as a precision problem. We can use more sophisticated instruments and achieve a better precision. But the discretization of time is a veritable paradigm shift in the way we think about reality. So much so that the problem appeared for the first time over 2,500 years ago when the great Greek philosophers started to think about why is it that we perceive reality the way we do. And the first character in the story here is Pythagoras, who in 500 BC maintained that 
Most of reality, if not all of reality, could be described in terms of numbers and measurements. Think, for instance, of the Pythagorean theorem. If one draws a right triangle, one can verify experimentally with a ruler that the square uh, built on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares built on the sides. But what Pythagoras said is that this is a universal property that applies to the abstract class of all right triangles. And this was really a major change in the way people started to think about abstract concepts. Pretty much at the same time, Parmenides, another character in our story, brought this line of reasoning more into the waters of metaphysics by planting the seed of a fundamental dichotomy, a fundamental difference between the reality that we can experience with our senses and an ideal reality that we will never be able to know. This, of course, was later developed by Plato into a full-fledged philosophical theory of the ideals, so that even today when we talk about the Platonic ideal, we refer to some form of perfect reality that lies beyond the veil of appearances. But more interestingly for us is the fact that right when these ideas started to appear in the global consciousness of the time, there were philosophers that were ready to point out the potential pitfalls of these new abstract models of reality. And the leader of the pack, so to speak, was Zeno of Elia, whose paradoxes have survived to this day. One of uh, Zeno's most famous paradoxes is the paradox of the arrow, which states that if you shoot an arrow from point A to point B, the arrow will never reach its destination. And the reasoning goes like so. Well, if we model reality with the concepts of geometry, then we know that any segment can be divided into smaller segments. So what Zeno said was that the arrow, after leaving point A and before reaching point B, will have to travel through the midpoint between A and B. Let's call this point C. But now, after it has reached the midpoint between A and B, it will also have to pass through the midpoint between C and B. Let's call this point D. And so on and so forth. For every interval, you can always find an extra midpoint, and the arrow will have to cross all of these midpoints before reaching its destination. But because of the geometric modeling of reality, there is an infinite number of midpoints, and so Zeno said, well, in order to cross an infinite number of points, you will need an infinite amount of time. Now, of course, today we rebut such an argumentation by saying simply that we can express the length of the segment as the sum of all the subsegments and that this sum converges to 1. But this is a false answer to the problem because the problem was never with computing the sum. The problem was with a model of reality in which the infinite and the finite are at odds. And it took over 2,000 years of mathematical and philosophical research to amend that model and come to today's model, a model in which the sum of an infinite number of terms can indeed converge to a finite quantity without contradictions. Now you see the relevance of this problem to digital signal processing where we are measuring physical quantities at regular intervals in time while assuming that the underlying physical quantity is actually continuous. One of the reasons why arriving at this better model of reality took over 2,000 years is that in the Middle Ages, as you can see from this picture, people were concerned with uh, much more mundane tasks than refining uh, a mathematical model of reality. But progress did come in the end, and the two towering figures of the 17th century, in this sense, are Galileo and Descartes. Descartes, the inventor of the Cartesian plane, started by putting name to things. So if you have a point on the plane like so, Descartes said, well, if I use a coordinate system around this point, I can give a name to this point, and I can use algebraic formulas to describe geometrical entities and perform operation on them. So, for instance, a line would map to a first-degree equation. This allowed Descartes to solve algebraically geometric problems that had baffled Greeks, such as, for instance, the trisection of the angle. Much more importantly for us is the fact that the Cartesian plane is the granddaddy of all vector spaces, and you will see how useful vector spaces are in the context of digital signal processing. Well, Europe in the 17th century was flush with money, and Europeans had two things on their mind, 
find a new market and win in the war of conquest that came with the appropriation of new markets. Calculus that was invented in those years purported to provide a new answer to both problems in the sense that you could use calculus to find optimal ship routes around the globe and to find optimal trajectory for cannonballs. Galileo in particular worked on the cannonball problem and operated by running a series of experiments in which the trajectory of balls thrown by a cannon was experimentally determined and then working backwards to derive an ideal platonic model of the ball's trajectory that is given by this equation where the initial velocity expressed as a vector in the Cartesian plane is coupled with the pull of gravity to give a parabolic shape. So the way science proceeded was by starting from a set of experimental data points and then work backwards to find the description of the underlying phenomenon in the form of a perfect algebraic equation. This usually worked very well for astronomy, which was a main concern in those days, because the trajectories of the planets are perfect conic curves. The invention of calculus and the availability of models for reality based on functions of real variables led naturally to what we call continuous time signal processing. So if you have a function like this, which is for instance the temperature function, you can compute the average in continuous time by taking the integral of the function over its support and dividing by the length of the support. Without calculus, what you would have to do is take daily measurements, say, of the temperature, and to compute the average, you would just sum these values together and then divide by the number of days. Now the question is, what is the relation between these two averages? What is the error I incur if I use experimental data rather than finding the ideal function behind the data and then computing the integral. And even if I can do that for certain signals that appear to be smooth and slow like this one, can I do the same if the signal is fast? In other words, if I have a set of measurements for something that appears to move quite quickly, do I have any chance even at recovering the ideal function that lies underneath the data. Well, it took a long time since uh, the 17th century to answer this question because one of the missing pieces of the puzzle was how to measure this speed of the signal. The answer came from Joseph Fourier, the inventor of Fourier analysis, that showed us how to decompose any physical phenomenon, any description of a physical phenomenon, into a series of sinusoidal components. A sinusoidal component is like a wave, and a wave is parametrized by its frequency, which is really a way of measuring how fast the wave oscillates. You can see an example of this sinusoidal decomposition of a signal in the spectral analyzer of your MP3 player. By splitting a signal into frequency components, you can see where the energy of the signal is, and if it is in the high frequencies, then the signal will be moving very fast, whereas if it is in the low frequencies, it will be moving very slow. The next piece of the puzzle that completes the path from continuous reality to discrete reality was given by Nyquist and Shannon, two researchers at uh, Bell Labs in the 50s. Their sampling theorem is really the bridge that connects the analog world to the digital world. The formula is like so, and it looks pretty complicated right now, but you will be very familiar with it by the end of the class. If you just have a tiny look at it, you will see that the formula relates a continuous time function, the platonic ideal we were talking about, to a set of discrete time measurements. And this sum really is a weighted sum where for each discrete sample we associate a special shape. Graphically it looks like so. If this is our continuous time function, the ideal function, and we have a set of measurements that we indicate with these red dots, we can reconstruct the original function starting from the samples just by associating what we call a sync function to each of the points. So you scale copies of the same function at each measured interval and then when you sum them all together you obtain the original function back. All you need for this magic trick to happen is that the original function is not too fast in the sense that it doesn't contain 
too many high frequencies. We will see this in more detail during the class. If we now go back to the beginning of our overview, you remember the second fundamental ingredient in digital signals is the discrete amplitude. What that means is that we have two forms of discretization of an ideal function. Take, for example, this uh, sine wave. The first discretization happens in time, and we get a discrete set of samples. And then the second discretization happens in amplitude, where each sample can take values only amongst a predetermined set of possible levels. The very important consequence of the discretization, independently of the number of levels, is that the set of levels is countable. So we can always map the level of a sample to an integer. If our data is just a set of integers now, it means that its representation is completely abstract and completely general purpose. This has some very important consequences in three domains. Storage becomes very easy because any memory support that can store integers can store signals. And computer memory comes to mind as a first candidate. Processing becomes completely independent on the nature of the signal because all we need is a processors that can deal with integers. And again, CPUs are general purpose processors that can deal with integers very, very well. And finally, transmission. With digital signal, we will be able to deploy very effective ways to combat noise and transmission errors, as we will see in a second. As far as storage is concerned, just consider the difference between attempting to store an analog signal which requires a medium-dependent support for each kind of application, and the task of storing a digital signal, which requires just a piece of computer memory. In analog storage, the medium evolved as technology evolved, and for instance, when it came to sound, we had wax cylinders in the beginning, and then you had vinyl, and then reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and then compact sets, and so on and so forth. Each medium was incompatible with its predecessor and required specialized hardware to be reproduced. Today, everything is stored in general-purpose support systems, like a memory card or a hard drive, and is completely independent on the type of content that is recorded. If you consider, for instance, the evolution of uh, memory supports, this is a famous picture from the Internet, just one micro SD card will contain all the information that was contained in countless floppy disks and CDs from just a few years back. But what does not change, although the support changes and the capacity improves with time, what does not change is the format of the data which will remain the same across media. When it comes to processing, again, the fact that the representation of the data is completely decoupled from the origin of the data will allow us to use general purpose machines. Here on the left you have three analog processing devices, a thermostat on top with its uh, temperature sensitive coil, you have a set of gears that for instance can be used to measure movement or time, and a discrete electronics amplifier. Each of these devices had to be designed and built to process just one type of analog signal. Conversely, on the right, you see just a piece of C code that implements a digital filter. Now, this filter can be used to process a temperature signal or a sound signal, and its structure or its implementation will not change. Finally, let's consider the problem of data transmission, which is probably the domain where digital signal processing has made the most difference in our day-to-day -day life. So if you have a communication channel and you try to send information from a transmitter to a receiver, you are faced with the fundamental problem of noise. So let's see what happens inside the channel. You have a signal that will be put into the channel. The channel will introduce an attenuation. It will lower the volume of the signal, so to speak, but it will also introduce some noise, indicated here as sigma of t. And what you will receive at the end is an attenuated copy of your original signal plus noise. These are just facts of nature that you cannot escape. So if this is your original signal, what you will get at the end is an attenuated copy, scaled by a factor of g, plus noise. So how do you recover the original information? Well, you try to undo the effects introduced by the channel, but the only thing you can undo is the attenuation. So you can try and multiply the received signal by a gain factor that is 
the reciprocal of the attenuation introduced by the channel. So if you do that, you introduce a gain here at the receiver, and what you get is, let's start again with the original signal, attenuated copy, some noise added, and then let's undo the attenuation. Well, what happens, unsurprisingly, is that the gain factor has also amplified the noise that was introduced by the channel. So you get a copy of the signal that is yes, of a comparable amplitude to the original signal, but in which the noise is much larger as well. This is a typical situation that you get in second generation or third generation copies of, say, a tape, or if you try and do a photocopy of a photocopy, just to give you an idea of what happens with this noise amplification problem. Now, why is this very important? This is important because if you have a very long cable, so, for instance, if you have a cable that goes from Europe to the United States, and you try to send a telephone conversation over there, what happens is that you have to split the channel into several chunks and try to undo the attenuation of a chunk in sequence. So you actually put what are called repeaters along the line that regenerate the signal to the original level every, say, 10 kilometers of cable or so. But unfortunately, the cumulative effect of this chain of receiver is that some noise gets introduced at its stage and gets amplified over and over again. So, for instance, if this is our original signal, which again gets attenuated and gets corrupted by noise in the first segment of the cable, after amplification, you would get this. We just seen that before. Then this signal is injected into the second section of the cable, it gets attenuated, new noise gets added to it, and when you amplify it, you get double the amplified noise. And after n sections of the cable, you have n times the amplified noise. This can lead very quickly to a complete loss of intelligibility in a phone conversation. Let's now consider the problem of transmitting a digital signal over the same transoceanic cable. Now, a digital signal, as we said before, is composed of samples whose values belong to a countable finite set of levels. And so their values can be mapped to a set of integers. Now, transmitting a set of integers means that we can encode these integers in binary format, and therefore we end up transmitting basically just a sequence of zeros and ones, binary digits. We can build an analog signal associating, say, the level plus 5 volt to the digit 0 and minus 5 volt to the digit 1, and we will have a signal and we will have a signal that will oscillate between these two levels as the digits are transmitted. What happens on the channel is the same as before. We will have an attenuation, we will have the addition of noise, and we will have an amplifier at each repeater that will try to undo the attenuation. But on top of it all, we will have what is called a threshold operator that will try to reconstitute the original signal as best as possible. Let's see how that works. If this is what we transmit, say an alternation of 0 and 1 mapped to these two voltage levels, the attenuation and the noise will reduce the signal to this state, the amplification will regenerate the levels and will amplify the noise. So the noise is much larger than before. But now we can just threshold and say if the signal value is above 0, we just output 5 volts. And vice versa, if it's below 0, we will output minus 5 volts. So the thresholding operator will reconstruct a signal like so. So you can see that at the end of the first repeater, we actually have an exact copy of the transmitted signal and not a noise-corrupted copy. The effectiveness of the digital transmission schemes can be appreciated by looking at the evolution of the throughput, the amount of information that can be put on a transatlantic cable. In 1866, the first cable was laid down, and it had a capacity of 8 words per minute, which corresponded to approximately 5 bits per second. In 1956, when the first digital cable was laid down on the ocean floor, the capacity all of a sudden skyrocketed to 3 megabits per second, so 10 to the power of 6, 6 order of magnitudes larger than the analog cable. And in 2005, when a fiber cable was laid down, another six order of magnitude were added for a capacity of 8.4 terabits per second. Similarly, and literally closer to home, we can look at the evolution of the throughput for in-home data transmission. 
In the 50s, the first voice band modems came out of Bell Labs, voice band meaning that there were devices designed to operate over a standard telephone channel. Their capacity was very low, 1200 bits per second, and there were analog devices. With the digital revolution, in the 90s, digital modems started to appear and very quickly reached basically the ultimate limit of data transmission over the voice band channel, which was 56 kilobits per second at the end of the 90s. The transition to ADSL pushed that limit up to over 24 megabits per second in 2008. Now, this evolution is, of course, partly due to improvements in electronics and to better phone lines. But fundamentally, its success and its affordability are due to the use of digital signal processing. We can use small yet very powerful and cheap general purpose processors to bring the power of error correcting codes and data recovery even in small home consumer devices. In the next few weeks we will study signal processing st starting from the ground up and by the end of the class we will have enough tricks in our bag to fully understand how an ADSL modem works. And so after this very far reaching and probably rambling introduction it's time to go back to basics and we will see you in module 2 to discover what discrete time signals are all about.